Chapter Eleven of On the Iron at Big Cloud by Frank L. Packard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter Eleven. Where's Haggerty? The Hill Division was proud enough over it, of course, for Carleton was its own chief. But none the less, it read General Order Number Thirty Eight with dismay and misgiving. T. J. Hale, the G. O. ran is hereby appointed superintendent of the hill division with headquarters at big cloud vice h b carleton promoted to general manager of the system now who in the double blank blankety blank blazes is hale demanded the roundhouse and the engine crews carleton was all to the good huh what growled the dispatchers the train crews swung their lanterns with a defiant air and the passenger conductors juggled their punches around their little fingers, smiling a superior smile to themselves. Hale might be a good man, perhaps he was, but Carleton was Royal Carleton. I guess he'll get along all right with us, but he don't want to get fresh, that's all. Where'd he come from, huh? That question at first no one seemed able to answer. The general impression was that the Transcontinental had got him from some eastern road. Certainly he was a new man, brand new, to the system. And then the renown of one Haggerty, who was breaking on a passenger local, became great, and in consequence the displeasure of the division increased. Said Haggerty, When I was on the pen five years back, this fellow Hale was assistant super. I knew him well. You want to look out for him. You can take my little word for that. He's a holy terror, and that's a fact. Got any chewing? Haggerty got his chewing, being an egregious liar, and Hale got a damaged reputation for the same reason. But Haggerty got more than his chewing, and he had not long to wait. On the day that the new super was expected, Haggerty, on passenger local number seven, got into Big Cloud about noon and taking advantage of the ten-minute wait for refreshments, straddled a stool at the lunch counter. Between bites he fired questions at Spence, the dispatcher, who was bolting his midday meal. "'Hail come yet?' he demanded. "'Haven't seen him,' replied Spence. "'When do you expect him?' persisted Haggerty. "'I don't know,' Spence answered. "'Oh, don't be so blasted close,' snapped Haggerty. You ain't giving away any weighty secret if you let out what time the special will be along, I suppose. I haven't heard of any special, said Spence. Say, Haggerty, they tell me Hale's no friend of yours, huh? No wonder you're anxious. I forgot about that. As soon as I get word about him, I'll wire up the line so's you can jump your train, come back on a hand car, and be here on the platform to meet him. You'll go to blazes retorted Haggerty, and scowled across the counter at an inoffensive-looking little fellow who had taken the liberty of smiling at the dispatcher's words. At Haggerty's look, the smile disappeared in a cup of coffee raised hastily to the lips. Huh! snorted Haggerty, by way of driving home to the other the audacity and temerity of his act, and likewise the inadvisability of repeating it. Haggerty was galled. Once before that morning he had been obliged to relegate this insignificant, squint, eye-glassed individual, who had persisted in riding on the platform, to a proper sense of submission, and the method employed had been no more delicate a one than that of jerking the man bodily into the car by the collar of his coat. Huh! he repeated with rising inflection. No, Haggerty, went on Spence pleasantly, don't you worry, I won't fail you. When the super steps off the train and the first words he says is, Where's Haggerty? And you're not here to respond in kind, I can plainly see there'll be doings. Oh, no, don't you fret. I'll not throw you down on anything like that. Twouldn't be wise for us. It's got to live with him, to rile him up at the outset. No, it certainly wouldn't. What? You go bite on a brake shoe. You're too sharp to be munching donuts, snarled Haggerty and swinging himself from his seat, he went back to his train. An hour later, when he reached Elk River, the end of his run, he found a telegram waiting for him from Spence. He sucked in his under lip as he read it. "'You sly joker,' wired the dispatcher. "'Why didn't you tell us that your friend came up with you on number seven? 
Haggerty pushed his cap to the back of his head and swore softly under his breath. He began to go over in his mind the passengers that had been aboard the train when they ran into Big Cloud. No one individual seemed to stand out carded and way-billed as the new super. Then an idea struck Haggerty, and he climbed into the rear coach where Berkeley, his conductor, was making up his report sheets. "'Say, Jim,' said Haggerty, "'was there any passes into Big Cloud this morning?' Berkeley looked up suspiciously. "'You'll mind your own business, and you'll get along better,' he snapped. "'Oh, punk,' returned Haggerty. "'My count's the same as yours, ain't it? "'What's the matter with you, then? "'Honest, Jim, I want to know. "'Was there any passes?' "'No, there wasn't,' grunted Berkeley, cooling down a little. "'Well, then you might have said so at first "'instead of jumping a fellow for nothing,' said Haggerty, "'and went out of the car to hang meditatively over the handrail "'and spit reflectively at the ties. "'Now wouldn't that sting you?' he demanded of the universe in general. "'Wouldn't that sting you? "'Who ever heard of a new super coming on the job "'riding a local on a ticket? "'And me asking when he was going to turn up? "'Oh, yeah, it sure would sting you. "'That funny boy Spence will pass this along and... "'Oh, punk. "'I ain't sure it wouldn't have been better "'if I'd kept my mouth shut about knowing Hale. "'But who'd ever thought he'd come up on my train? "'How was I to know, huh?' and during all that afternoon's layup at Elk River, Haggerty pondered the matter. He continued to ponder it as he pulled out for the return trip in the evening, and he was still pondering it when they whistled for Big Cloud. There was no moon up that night, and it was pretty dark as they ran in. Haggerty, with his lantern, was standing on the rear end. As the train slowed itself to a halt, a man came tearing down the station platform at a run. "'Where's Haggerty?' he called breathlessly. "'Where's—' "'Here,' said Haggerty promptly, leaning out over the steps and showing his light. "'What do you want?' "'Oh, all right,' said the man. "'I'll be back.' And he disappeared in the shadow of the station. "'He acts like he was nutty,' muttered Haggerty, and swung himself off the steps. But though Haggerty waited, the man did not come back, and he had not come back when the train began to roll out of the station, and Haggerty was again on the rear platform of the car. Then, just as his hand reached out to open the door, he stopped and started suddenly as though he had been stung. A voice came out of the darkness from the other side of the tracks over by the roundhouse. "'Where's Haggerty?' it demanded anxiously. Then Haggerty tumbled, and his face went red with rage. He leaned far out over the rail, and forgetful that the pantomime was lost in the darkness, shook his clenched fist in the direction from whence the voice had come. "'You go to hell, hell, hell!' he bawled, the exclamation shaken into syllables by reason of the car wheels jolting over the siding switches at that precise moment. And then, his senses being very acute, from where the light shone in the dispatcher's window, he thought he heard, above the momentarily increasing rattle of the train, a laugh a laugh that produced anything but a quieting effect on his already outraged sensibilities. Now Haggerty was not the nature of those who can pass lightly over a joke at their own expense, especially if that joke is too prolonged and carries with it a hint of underlying venom. Therefore, as the one on Haggerty spread over the division, and scarcely an hour of the day passed that the cry, Where's Haggerty?, did not reach his ears, he began to sulk and treasure up his injury. The division was rubbing it in pretty hard. But the curious part of it all was that his bitterness was not directed against himself, who was the direct cause of his discomfiture, nor against Spence, who was the indirect cause, but against Hale, who was no cause at all. Just once had Haggerty seen the superintendent. Hale was pointed out to him on the platform at Big Cloud, and Haggerty had ducked hastily back inside his train. Hale was the inoffensive little fellow he had treated with such scant courtesy at the lunch counter, the insignificant, squint-eyed, glassed individual he had hauled from the car platform by the coat collar. When Haggerty's mingled feelings of perturbation and amazement permitted him any speech at all, it was rather incoherent 
that the runt he gasped and subsided into an empty seat and in this inelegant but pithy summing up of the capacity and dimensions of the new official the division was with him to the last section hand him a railroad man the hill division remembered royal carleton and was ashamed and it rankled for the shame that it considered had been put upon it out of it all haggerty was the only thing of saving grace so upon haggerty they loosened behind the humor some of their bitterness haggerty became the safety valve of the division a month had gone by and hale had lived well up to what his appearance had led them to expect he might have been an automaton for all the signs of life that emanated from his office just routine the routine business routine that was all the disquiet and unrest that brooded over the division became contempt the kind of contempt that made the car tinks put on airs and in their heart of hearts figure themselves better railroad men than he who sat over them in supreme authority even haggerty no longer ducked out of sight when circumstances required that he should breathe the same air as his superior haggerty had acquired a swagger also he now voiced his opinion his cordially poor opinion of mr hale without restraint and with no check upon his tongue and then haggerty got a shock it was imparted by spence got it from hale's clerk last night said the dispatcher he's going to run an inspection special over the division and has picked out the fag end of all things for the crew he picked you first haggerty ah forget it growled haggerty with a scowl i think there's something behind it though spence went on his voice modulated confidentially between you and me haggerty the inspection trip is a bluff haggerty pricked up his ears how's that he demanded well said spence serenely backing to a safe distance i think he's hurt at the way you cut him since he's been here he's pining for your company and Haggerty sprang to his feet from the baggage truck on which he had been seated and shook his fist frantically at the fast-retreating figure. He was still gesticulating fiercely and muttering savagely to himself when the window in the dispatcher's room overhead opened softly and Spence stuck out his head. "'Hey there, Haggerty,' he called. "'Quit practicing that deaf and dumb alphabet. You haven't got any time to waste. You want to run along and get to the missus to press you out a pair of panties and iron a boiled shirt for you. You'll get your orders in the morning. Come down here for one minute, choked Haggerty, his rage fanned to a white heat by the knowledge of his own impotence, for Spence, as he well knew, was safely entrenched behind locked doors. Just one minute and I'll make your face look like it had never been born. I will that. Haggerty, said Spence in an injured tone as the window closed, you are disgruntled. But Haggerty was to be still more disgruntled, for the next morning, true to Spence's words, he found himself assigned to Inspection Special Number 89. Haggerty was not happy, but he boarded the forward car as they pulled out for the mountains with the mental resolution that he would keep out of the super's way. Resolutions, however, like many other things, are sometimes rudely upset in the face of conditions that are not taken into account in the reckoning. They had been running at a forty-mile clip, and were about into the yard at Coyote Bend, when Haggerty nearly went to the floor as the air came on with a sudden rush, and the train came jerking to a halt like a bucking bronco. The whistle was going like mad for the block ahead. Haggerty grabbed his red flag, dropped to the ground, and ran back past the super's car to take his distance. Up ahead he could see the tail end of a freight disappearing around the bend, crawling into safety on the siding. Nothing very interesting about that. Somebody would get Tokyo for laying out the special, he supposed. Maybe the freight had had a breakdown and was off schedule making the bend. Personally, Haggerty did not care. It made very little difference to him. He picked up a handful of stones and began to plug them at the nearest telegraph pole. Suddenly he changed the direction of his shots and let fly with all his might at a gopher he had spotted squatting in front of his hole. "'Holy Mac!' he ejaculated in unbounded astonishment. "'I believe I hit the cuss!' And he went back to see. 
Just as he got down the embankment, the special began to whistle for her flag, one, two, three, four, and Haggerty, scrambling to the track again, began to run. But fast as he ran, he had only covered about half the distance when the train began to move. It was therefore a very breathless and panting Haggerty who just managed to grab the rail of the rear car, the super's car. There was nothing for it but to pass through, and Haggerty, with his acquired swagger, started. The super was alone in the rear compartment, seated at a table, a mass of papers before him. Haggerty was industriously rolling up his flag as he passed along. Haggerty! Haggerty stopped and swung around at the sound of his name. Hale reached his hand into a box of cigars that lay open on the table, selected one carefully, lighted it, and leaned back in his chair. "'I would like to offer you one, Haggerty,' he said quietly, "'but I am afraid you would misunderstand.' Haggerty shifted a little before the super's look. Somehow there wasn't any squint at all. Instead, behind the glasses, the gray eyes were remarkably bright and clear, and their steadiness was discomposing to Haggerty. "'It seems,' said Hale, a little smile playing around the corners of his mouth, "'that they don't measure men by the same standard out west here "'that they did when we were back in the pen together, hm?' "'Haggerty reddened. "'His only belief would have been in bluster. "'But, curiously enough, there was something about this little man, "'he couldn't tell just what, that made bluster impossible. "'Therefore Haggerty held his peace.' and his fingers played nervously with the flag, twirling it around and around, awkwardly. "'Don't make any mistake, Haggerty,' the super continued pleasantly. "'I'm not trying to rub it in. I want you to know that I've heard the story. I want you to know that I didn't nose it out. I heard it at the lunch counter that day after you went out, and before the men there knew who I was. I want to start straight with you, Haggerty.' Haggerty was puzzled and flustered at this opening. "'Well, though, sir,' he blurted out, uh, "'of course you you know it was all a lie. I, "'I only did it for a josh.' "'Yes, I understand,' Hale answered. "'In itself it didn't amount to anything, "'but the consequences are a little more than you reckoned on, aren't they? "'It's acted like a boomerang, "'and uh, you're pretty sore, Haggerty, aren't you?' "'The openness and friendly tones of the super "'took hold of Haggerty, and he warmed toward the other. "'Well, uh... "'Yes, sir, I, I, I suppose I am,' he admitted. Hale nodded. "'Now I want you to see the other side of it, Haggerty, my side. No division of any railroad, or anything else for that matter, can do itself justice unless everyone concerned with it is pulling together for it. I want every man out here with me, and first of all I want you. There is nothing destroys respect so much as ridicule. The division much after the fashion that an epidemic of measles springs up amongst children, took it into their heads to dislike the successor of Mr. Carlton, no matter who he might be. Now, unfortunately, instead of having checked the spread, the germs are being fostered because, uh, back of their fun with you, a description of contempt of me is constantly kept alive. So I want you to cooperate with me, Haggerty, and show them that, after all, whether I'm a holy terror or not, whether I'm a runt or a giant, no matter what, I'm entitled to a fair deal out here in the West. There, Haggerty, that's a pretty long sermon for me. I'm not much at preaching. Just turn what I've said over in your mind, that's all. I think I can safely offer you a cigar now. Will you have one? Haggerty accepted the cigar with a flustered mumble of thanks, and as he went forward to the other coach, he chewed the end pensively. "'Well, how's the little fella? Hope the ride ain't making him carsick,' sneered Slakely, the conductor. Haggerty strode up to the other and shoved his fist savagely within an inch of Slakely's nose. "'I'll have you know the soup is all right. You wall-eyed coyote, you. I'm telling you, he's a man.' Do I hear any remarks to the contrary? Say, gasped Slakely, blankly retreating down the side. What's the matter with you anyway? That's what's the matter. Haggerty's explanation was more forcible than explicit, though the meaning of his clenched fist, which he shook at the other, was pointed enough in its inference. That's what's the matter, my bucko, he repeated fiercely, and don't you forget it. 
I'm giving it to you straight, and I'll take none of your lip about it neither, see? Haggerty had raised the standard, not perhaps as the super had expected, but according to his own ideas, or rather to his fiery temper, which led him to act blindly on the spur of the moment as his impulse directed. But it was not this method of Haggerty's, if such a term could by any stretch of the imagination be applied to Haggerty, that was to bring about the desired result, and at the same time rid him of his tormentors, tormentors who continued to sound the cry, where's Haggerty, with the undiminished frequency, tormentors who were much too wary to allow themselves to be caught anywhere within striking distance, for Haggerty's forearm was a thing to wonder at. Instead, the end came from another source as totally different as it was unexpected. It came on the third day of the inspection trip up in the Rockies at the new bridge across the Stony River, and it was the new bridge that did it. They were to lay out there for the morning, and Haggerty started in to employ the two or three hours of leisure this gave him by looking over the work. It wasn't much of a bridge as bridges go, for the Stony wasn't much of a river, but the approaches were enough to pull the heart out of the stoutest bridge crew that ever toiled and sweated and slaved. Just rock, solid, gray, massive, and so it was blast, blast, last, hour after hour, all through the day, day after day. One span, resting on the shore abutments, was to bridge the canyon that yawned six hundred feet below, where the stony swirled and eddied, a foaming, angry, chattering little stream. On the eastern side, where Haggerty stood, the anchorage was pretty well under way, but over across on the western shore they were still pitting their blasting powder against the stubborn rock of the mountain side. Haggerty crossed over on the old bridge to take a look at this. Just as he reached the other side, a stationary engine blew shrilly for a blast, and the men began to run for cover. Haggerty pulled his watch and marked the time, one minute and fifteen seconds. Then the blast thundered, echoed, re-echoed, and died away through the mountains. He joined the men as they went back to their work. "'Holy Mac!' he exclaimed to the foreman as he peered over the edge of the excavation and looked down some fifteen or twenty feet to the ledge where the men were already busy again. Holy Mac! You gotta look sharp, huh? Oh, I don't know, replied the foreman. We give em plenty of time. When the whistle blows, the men hump it. We don't touch the button till the last one is crawling over the top of the bank. Then with the time fuse, there's a minute, lots of time. Haggerty looked on for a while. Then he turned away, sat down by one of the shanties, and loaded his pipe. The pipe once alight, he settled himself in a more comfortable position by sprawling on his back, his hands under his head. From where he lay, he commanded a view of the other side of the river, as well as the work before him. He could see Hale, across there, talking to one of the bridge engineers. He watched the two men lazily in drowsy contentment, until he lost sight of them as they started to come over to his side, then his attention became riveted again on his immediate surroundings. They were getting ready for another blast. Haggerty sat up. It was rather exciting to see the men come scrambling out of the hole. The whistle had just gone three toots. They were coming now, one head after another, popping up over the edge. Then the shoulders, and finally the men on their feet, running like deers for shelter. Not far, only a few yards, for the excavation itself afforded protection once clear of it. Haggerty himself was not fifteen yards away. He counted the men as they came out. It was the eighteenth who, just as his head and shoulders appeared, waved an arm and shouted, All out! Let her go! He saw the foreman bend over the battery and make the connection that would spark the time fuse at the other end, and then a groan of horror went up around him. Number eighteen, with a cry and a desperate effort to pull himself over the top, had slipped back and disappeared from sight. Haggerty's pipe dropped to the ground from between his teeth, his heart seemed to stop its beats, a cold sweat broke out upon his face. He was on his feet now, and the foreman's words were ringing in his ears. Then there's a minute, lots of time. Then there's a minute, lots of time. He began to run, and the seconds as he ran lengthened into years and cycles. My God, he muttered in a catchy way. But fast as he ran, someone was faster than he. Five yards from the edge of the excavation, a figure, small, short, speeding like the wind, passed him. It was Hale, the super. 
Behind, the foreman's voice bellowed hoarsely, Come back! Come back! You can't get to the fuse! Do you hear? Maybe, Haggerty mumbled between his teeth, maybe we can get the man. Mary, mother, help us. Hale, flat on the ground, was making to swing himself over as Haggerty, for the second time, caught him by the collar of his coat. You ain't strong enough, he grunted, yanking the super back. You help me from the top. And over the edge he went himself. Then there's a minute, lots of time. The words again came unbidden. How much, in God's name, how much of that minute had gone, how much was left? His teeth were set, his heart pounds so fierce and rapid that his breath came hard and choked as he lowered himself to a little ledge, projecting out some seven or eight feet below the surface that had caught and held the body of number 18. The man lay there groaning. It was easy to see what had happened. A misplaced step in the climb, then a loosened rock, his balance gone, and the stone had crushed down upon his legs and ankles. There was a look of helpless terror in the eyes of the wounded man as Haggerty reached and bent over him. Get out! The white lips quivered. You ain't got time. I give the signal. The blast'll be going now. There's a minute, lots of time, said Haggerty in a sing-song, crazy way. He was trying to fit the words to an air he had heard somewhere. Queer, he couldn't remember it. The words were straight enough. Then he laughed, foolishly, as he worked like a madman. He had raised the man in his arms, and now, heaving with all his strength and gradually pushing him up, up, the strain became terrific. Haggerty's muscles cracked. One of his arms was almost useless to him, owing to the narrowness of the ledge that to maintain even a precarious footing on, little by little he rose to an upright position, forced him tight against the wall of rock and earth. Haggerty panted with cruel, gasping sobs. And there's a minute, lots of time. The repetition of the words came surging upon him with a shock of horror, lending him a frenzied strength, a desperate twist and he had made the half-turn that brought his back to the cutting. His other arm was free now. A heave, and he had swung number 18 above his shoulders within reach of the super's outstretched hands. A second more, and with Hale pulling above and Haggerty lifting below, the man, with a cry of agony as his wounded leg banged limply against the ground, was forced up over the bank. "'Quick, Haggerty! For God's sake, be quick yourself!' cried Hale. "'Hurry, man! Hurry!' There's a minute. Haggerty sprang for the top of the bank, clutched it. Lots of... The last word was blotted out as he dragged himself over the edge and heard Hale's sharp command. Lie flat! From behind and below him came the roar of the detonation. He felt the ground shake and quiver beneath him. The echoes were rolling and reverberating like a park of artillery. Then Hale's low, fervent, thank God... It was Hale who got it first as the mob of men rushed forward, cheering, laughing, gabbling hysterically, and it was at Hale's uplifted hand that the clamor died suddenly away, and in its stead came the super's voice in quiet tones. Where's Haggerty? Ah, oh, go on, sputtered Haggerty sheepishly, trying to fight his way out of the crowd that pressed upon him to haul and maul him, to thump his back, to shake his hand. Ah, oh, go on. I want to get me pipe that I left over there by the shanty. End of chapter 11。Chapter 12 of On the Iron at Big Cloud by Frank L. Packard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 12 McQueen's Hobby. There isn't much use in talking about the logical or the illogical when you come to couple up with a man's hobby, because a hobby is a hobby, and that's all there is to it, with nothing left to be said on the subject. Most men have a hobby. McQueen's was coal. Just coal. McQueen talked coal with a persistence that was amazing. On all occasions and under any pretext it was coal when he was off schedule with the regularity that entailed his presence on the carpet before the division superintendent, it was coal. Did he break down between meeting points with the attendant result that the dispatchers fretted and fumed and swore as they readjusted their schedules and rearranged their train sheets, it was coal. Everlastingly and eternally coal. What's coal? McQueen would demand oracularly. 
It's carbon and oxygen and hydrogen with a dash of nitrogen, ain't it? Well, then, what are you talking about? Coal ain't just coal. Some of it's mostly slate. Two hundred and ten pounds all the way, all the time, with the great bars cluttered with that. Huh? What? No purchasing agent that had ever hit the division had been quite able to satisfy McQueen with the brand of the commodity that was supplied in accordance with the requisition orders that he drew. And so, day in and day out, Big 802 puffed her way through the mountains, and McQueen in the cab absorbed coal statistics, coal data, coal everything, with an avidity, a thoroughness, and a masterliness of detail that would have put some noted geologist to shame and given the rest a run to hold their rights on the marked-up schedule. Up at headquarters, when things were running smoothly and McQueen was behaving himself with no scores chalked up against him on the time card, they treated his hobby as a joke, so that when his whistle boomed out of the gorge to the westward or shrilled across the cut to the eastward, followed a moment afterward by the sight of the big flying mogul with her string of slewing dark green coaches, the staff on duty at Big Cloud would lean from the upper windows and watch the limited as she shattered the yard switches with a roar, watched as with a hiss of the air and the grinding of the brake shoes as they sparked the tires, she would draw up panting at the platform and the big engineer would swing himself from the cab for an oil around. Then the badinage flew thick and fast while McQueen swabbed his hands on a hunk of waste and punctuated his remarks with squirts from his long-spouted can as he filled the thirsty oil cups. So the big fellows laughed and joked, and the Brotherhood chaffed him unmercifully. If anyone had asked McQueen what had started, let alone caused him to exhaust the subject of coal with such painstaking and conscientious insistence, he couldn't for the life of him have answered. It had started, just started, that's all and, fascinating him, had pursued its insidious advance unchecked and unquestioned. That is, unquestioned until one morning when Clarahue, the turner at the Big Cloud Roundhouse, kind of jerked him up a little on the proposition. You're against the red. You and your coal, Mac. All right, all right. Clarahue chuckled as the engineer came in to sign on for the day's run. McQueen was patting 807 slide bars affectionately. How's that? he asked. Well... Oil? repeated McQueen, puzzled. Sure thing. No more coal, no more slate, no more cinders. You touch her off and there you are. You'll have to cut out the coal and plug up on oil, Mac. Oh, said McQueen, enlightened. Oil burners, huh? I saw one of them down east. They're evil smelling, inhuman, stinking brutes. That's what they are. Don't you let them sidetrack you like that, son. They may do down there, but not in the hills. Not while you and me are pulling throttles, and don't you think so? Clarahue grinned. Well, maybe, said he. But say, honest, Mac, what's the sense of gassing about coal the way you do? What's to come out of it? What's the good of it? You just get the laugh from the boys, what? McQueen's answer was to scratch his head. To put the matter into the concrete class of practicability was a phase of the subject that he had not considered. He scratched his head when the turner had gone, and also he scratched his head for several days thereafter. Then he caught at a happy inspiration whereby to solve the riddle, and therein he fell, but of that in a moment. Things were booming on the Hill Division. Traffic was doubled, troubled. Everything on the train sheets was in sections. Promotions flew thick and fast. Wipers were set to firing, and the firemen moved over to the right-hand side of the cabs. Every wheel the division could beg, borrow, or steal was doing fancy time stunts smashing records. Everyone from car tink to superintendent was on the jump. Even the directors, not to be outdone in the general order of things, worked overtime rubbing fat hands in gleeful anticipation of juicy, luscious dividends to be. Only they neglected to figure in Noonan as an item on the balance sheets. Noonan? Where is the Brotherhood that does not number among its members men with grievances, fancy or real? Noonan had a grievance, no particular grievance, just a grievance, and Noonan was a power in that branch of the Brotherhood that held sway over the Hill Division. Noonan always had a grievance, due primarily to the fact that he had a deep and long-seated grudge against himself. It dated way back. He'd been born that way. Grievances! he sputtered to a group of his admirers. Grievances! 
Why, we're against the worst of it all the time. We're not track walkers, are we? Well, Dan, who runs the road? It's us on the throttles, what? Who's to blame for our measly schedule of hours and pay? We are, because we haven't the sand to stand up for our rights. That's what, and don't you forget it. There was a chorus of assent. Noonan's right, said one Devins. Only it don't look to me like now was what you might rightly call the time to growl. Times are good, everything double-headed, and the pay cars running carload lots. Noonan glared. You got the brains of a piston head, that's what you have, he exploded. It's times like these we'd win hands down. Perhaps you'd like to wait till there's nothing doing, and they're laying the boys off, and everybody mostly is running spare. What chance do you think any demands would stand then? Of a truth, it was the accepted time and a most glorious opportunity. In that, Noonan was right. Only one obstacle lay between him and the accomplishment of his cherished ambition to make something of his troublemaking proclivities and become a leader of men in a strike. That obstacle was McQueen. McQueen was a company man. Out and out a company man though nothing would have surprised McQueen more than to learn that he was looked up to as a leader by the conservative element of the Brotherhood. True, he and his coal was the joke of the division, but that was only a joke and in no wise to be held up against him. His influence, of whose existence he was oblivious, was based on things apart from that. Big, kindly, honest, incapable of deceit, simple, straightforward, staunch in his friendships, somewhat inclined to stubbornness in his beliefs, perhaps, easily ruffled but as easily pacified, such was McQueen. Such was the McQueen the officials honored, and such was the McQueen with whom the boys would gladly and loyally have shared their paychecks to the last cent. All this Noonan knew. Knew, too, that to gain his end he must first win over McQueen, and to that object he began to devote himself. He and McQueen shared the honors of the fast mail, and under ordinary conditions communication between the two men was limited to a flirt of the hand from the cab as one or other of them tore by the siding designated as their meeting point by the lords of the road, the dispatchers. But now things were a bit different. Everything was more or less off schedule, and while the limited east and west was nursed along as near her running time as possible, and generally got the best of it over everything else, there were nevertheless occasions when both men were stalled together on time orders at the same point. Noonan tackled McQueen at the first opportunity. He picked his way cautiously, as though not quite sure of his rights and ready for a quick reverse. "'Say, Mac,' he began, "'what do you think of all this talk uh, that's going round? Talk, said McQueen. What talk? You don't mean to say, gasped Noonan in well-simulated surprise, that you haven't heard it. And the boys are slinging it pretty hard at that. I haven't heard anything, McQueen answered, slightly suspicious that Noonan was about to spring one at his expense. What you're giving us? Straight, confided Noonan earnestly. It's strike, Mac. That's what. Strike? ejaculated McQueen, bewildered. What for? What for? cried Noonan. What for? That's a sweet question to ask. Well, pretty dash near everything. He waved his hand expansively. Hours, scale, and, and, and... McQueen shook his head. I'm not kicking, he said. I don't see anything to strike about. Looks to me as though you fellas were hunting trouble. You'll probably get it, what? You never see anything. Noonan blurted out, irritation getting the better of diplomacy. Nothing but the blamed coal you're forever yapping about. What I know about coal, returned McQueen with dignity, you'll never know. It's a subject that requires brains. Is that so? Noonan jeered. You tell it. It requires brains, McQueen repeated stolidly. It's a shame that the only man on the division that has them don't know how to use them then, Noonan prodded. Who cares about your blazing old coal and what it's made of? Talk's cheap. There's no sense to it anyhow. Maybe there isn't, and then, again, maybe there is. At any rate, there's a dollar a day for every man pulling a throttle, McQueen announced triumphantly. I don't know yet just how much for the firemen. I haven't figured it on their schedule. Noonan pricked up his ears. What's that you say, Mac? He demanded. Here was McQueen's vindication. 
They'd laugh at his absurd, pointless theories on coal, would they? Well, then, he'd show them. And it wasn't any of their business either how many days he'd racked his brains puzzling out an adequate solution to the question Clarahue had flung at him. He shook two impressive fat fingers at Noonan. One dollar a day, every day, and the spare men proportionately, that's what. Do you get that, Noonan? Rats, said Noonan. You'd better go into the shops for repairs. You need new stay bolts on your dome cover. Never you mind my dome cover. McQueen flung back, beginning to get exasperated. It may need a little tinkering, but it's not ready for the scrap heat yet, the way some are I could mention, but won't. It all goes back to what I said. It's a subject that requires brains, which you haven't got any. There's no use explaining anything to you, because— You can't, Noonan interrupted craftily. You're only long on wind, Mac. You listen to me, you rust-jointed disgrace to the throttle cried McQueen, stung into retort. You listen to me. What are you paid for? Mileage, ain't it? How do you get your mileage? Steam. What makes steam? Coal. Yeah, coal. Coal, and don't you forget it. Well, then, poor coal means poor steam, and poor steam means poor mileage. Don't it? What? Noonan burst into a loud and derisive guffaw. McQueen glared. You're a wild, uneducated, hee-hawing ass, he choked. What do you know, anyway? Nothing. But I know. A dollar a day, I said, and I say so now. I figured it out. It's the difference between the mileage we make and the mileage we could make in the same time. That totes up to one dollar a day. Supposing that they wouldn't let us have any more mileage than they do now, well, we'd do it in better time, and the difference would be ours, wouldn't it? And time's money. And that totes up to one dollar a day just the same. It's the same either way, time or mileage. Take your choice. There, Johnny, that's a good boy. Run along and fetch me a bucket of steam, Noonan scoffed. With a snort of unutterable contempt, McQueen turned to swing himself into his cab. Uh, hold on a minute, Mac, Noonan cried, afraid that he had overstepped himself. Don't get whiffy. I, I swear, I believe you're right. Uh, uh, let's see how you figure it. And McQueen, mollified, figured it. Figured it with the stub of a pencil in greasy, scrawling characters on the back of a time order. As to the process by which the conclusion was arrived at, that was something of which Noonan was in profound and utter ignorance. Whether it was right or wrong, he did not know. He never knew, and cared less. Certainly, the result was there. McQueen completed the last figure of his calculations with a flourish. There, he cried exultingly. How about it now, hmm? Noonan took the paper, wrinkled his brows, pursed his lips, and stared at it with the air of a connoisseur of calculus. Mm, said he slowly. Are you dead sure it's right, Mac? Right, McQueen fairly yelled, touched in another tender spot. Right. Confound you, it's there in black and white, ain't it? Figures don't lie, do they? Well, what in thunder's wrong with you, then? I wanted to make sure, Mac, that's all. Holy fish plates, I knew it was bad, rotten bad, but I didn't think that they were handing it to us like this. You bet it's bad. It's the worst ever. There's more kinds of coal than there are spikes in the right away from here to Big Cloud and back again. But the coal we get is the last on the list. Bad. That's what I've always said, ain't it? It's fierce, continued Noonan with rising emphasis, and when the boys hear this, it'll be the last straw. They'll fix them. Fix who? inquired McQueen blankly. Why ain't I telling you? The company. Uh, I was talking about the coal, said McQueen a little uneasily. Sure you were, Noonan agreed heartily. Sure you were, a and how the company is robbing every engineer on the division of a dollar a day, to say nothing of the firemen and the train crews. It's enough to make a man mad. Well, I should say yes. Uh, I didn't say the company was robbing us protested McQueen. What's that? cried Noonan sharply, then in apparent disgust. So your crazy old figures are just gas bag filling like the rest of your coal talk, huh? They did look pretty scaly, and that's a fact. I had my suspicions. That's why I asked you if you were sure they were right. But I might have known they weren't without asking. Oh, you might, might you, exploded McQueen, goaded once more into angry outburst. You and your suspicions. Who are you? 
I'll tell you that they are right, and that's the end of it. Well, if they're right, why don't you stand by them, then? We're being robbed every day we work, ain't we? Yes, I suppose we are, McQueen admitted reluctantly, but I didn't figure it out for the purpose of— Mac, Noonan interrupted unctuously, tain't for you nor me to say the purpose it's to be put to. There's others besides us. But I do say, Mac, you're almighty smart. McQueen shook his head. I'm a company man, he said dubiously. Company man, of course you are. We're all company men. But right's right and wrong's wrong before anything else. Well, ta-ta, Mac. See you again. I'm off. There's Hake with the tissue. I'll tell the boys where you stand. It was a somewhat dazed McQueen that in turn pulled himself up into his own cab. He stood in the gangway and squinted meditatively at the coal heaped high on the tender. To his conscientious self-communion, his triumphant vindication had somewhat the appearance of a boomerang. I don't know he reflected. It is damn poor coal, and figures don't lie. We, uh, we've been getting the worst of it, and, and a man should stand up for his rights. And while McQueen, busy with new and momentous problems, was steaming west into the Rockies, Noonan, with his tongue in his cheek, was cutting along for Big Cloud with a wide-flung throttle. That night at Big Cloud, Noonan's cronies got the story. That is, they got what Noonan saw fit to tell them. And the burden of his tale was that McQueen was with the Brotherhood and against the company. That was sufficient. They looked with appreciative admiration at the man who had done the trick, and then they flew to obey his orders. By morning, every engineer on the division had the news. On way freights, on stray freights, on regulars, specials, and sections, they got it, every last one of them. And McQueen, coming east again on number two, got it, and marveled a little at his new importance, never seeing Noonan's hand in the marked deference paid to him. First and last, it was a bad business. Bad for the company, bad for the hotheads led by Noonan, bad for the others, and bad for McQueen. It caught the company none too well prepared, and Carleton, for this happened in the days of his superintendency, was hard put to, to move anything. There was pretty bitter feeling, and before it was over there was blood spilled. But the roughs at Big Cloud, who didn't know the pilot from a horn block, were responsible for most of that, though in their own way, too, they ended it. It came to a showdown the night they carried young Carl Davis home from the yard on a door they had wrenched from a boxcar. Davis was breaking in the yard then, and he was a nephew of McQueen's. He had lived with the engineer ever since as a little chap of ten he had come out to the west, Childless themselves, McQueen and his wife thought as much of the lad as though he had been their own. McQueen, in his grief, didn't get the rights of it. Only in a confused sort of a way he understood the roughs had winged the boy with a cowardly shot, meaning perhaps to do no more than shoot out his lamp as he swung by on the top of a car. And while his wife, with tender hands, busied herself in rendering such assistance to the surgeon as she could, McQueen sat in a chair and stared, dry-eyed and bitter of heart, at the white face on the bed. Also, McQueen was getting sense. Certainly he had never intended to strike. Now the shock of Carl's hurt had sobered his judgment, and he saw things as he should have seen them, saw them as he cursed himself for not having seen them before he had allowed his senseless egotism to carry him off his feet. As the thoughts came crowding through his brain, his cheeks burned dull red at his own shame. But through it all he blamed only himself, with never an inkling that he had been used as a cat's paw by the crafty Noonan. That was to come afterward. McQueen waited only to wring a half-grudging assurance from the doctor that the boy would pull through. Then he took his hat and left the house. It was getting on toward eleven o'clock when he walked into the hall across from the station where the boys had their headquarters, and had been in the habit of congregating each night ever since the strike began. Usually noisy in a good-natured, devil-may-care way, there was a subdued and serious quiet pervading the room as McQueen stepped in. The shooting in the yard was something they had not counted on, and like McQueen, it was acting on them as a tonic. All except Noonan, who, evidently bolstered up by a few drinks, was more noisy, hilarious, and quarrelsome than ever. 
McQueen answered the questions they crowded at him as to the boy's condition soberly, and going over to Noonim, took him by the arm and led him into a corner. "'The game ain't worth it,' he said shortly. "'I've had my lesson tonight, and I'm through.' "'What for?' demanded Noonan aggressively. "'We didn't have anything to do with it. We're not responsible, are we?' "'We are,' said McQueen sturdily. "'Morally responsible.' "'Morally responsible,' Noonan mocked with a sneer. "'Oh, Mama, listen to him. Streak of yellow, that's you, McQueen.' Then fiercely, "'You play the scab, I'll bash your head to jelly.' "'You're drunk,' retorted McQueen contemptuously. "'Drunk, huh? <laughs> I'm not so drunk but what I know who's running this strike. It's me, and you don't forget it. And what I say goes, do you hear?' "'I'm asking you to call it off. Blood on our heads I won't stand for. Our grievances don't warrant what's likely to happen here if things go on. You owe it to the men who followed you into the strike, Noonan. Oh, I do, do I? Followed me into the strike, huh? How about the men that followed you? That followed me, repeated McQueen in amazement. Sure they followed you. You don't think I took any stock in your batty coal talk, did you? You must think I'm green. All I wanted was you. You bit fast and easy enough. The rest of the softies came along then like a pack of sheep. What do you think now about me owing it all to the men, Mr. Morally Responsible, huh? It took McQueen a minute to get the whole of it, the bitter whole of it. Then the blood rushed to his face in a crimson flood. He reached out and, grasping Noonan by the neck and shoulders, shook him as a terrier shakes a rat. You cur! he cried hoarsely and flung the other suddenly away against the wall. The men at the sound of the scuffle came running over. He's a scab! Kill him! shrieked Noonan. McQueen turned to face the men. If beating this strikes a scab, I'm a scab, he said quietly. I'm out to beat it right now. I've been a fool and I'm ready to admit it. But I didn't know until tonight that I'd been bait for a whining thing like that, pointing at Noonan. He says, some of you men came in on the strike because I did. If that's so then get out of it because I do. Get out of it before there's more on your hands than we'll be able to answer for when we go into division for the last time. That's all I've got to say. I'm going over now to ask Carlton to put me on again, and if it's nothing better than pulling away freight, and, and I hope you'll come with me. As the flood follows the fracture in the dam, so the breaking of the tension filled the room with pandemonium. Cheers, yells, hisses, curses, shouts. The Brotherhood was divided against itself. But ten minutes later, the majority of them were clustered behind McQueen in the super's office. Carlton and his staff were sleeping at headquarters those days, and they gathered in a group around the green-shaded lamp on the dispatcher's table to face the delegation. Mr. Carlton, McQueen began, we... That was all. He never got any further. From the platform outside came hoots and catcalls, and above the chorus, Noonan's voice. Soak the scab! Kill him! If he's so fond of it, let him have it! Now! The window pane was shivered with a crash, and McQueen, struck full in the head by a huge hunk of coal, sank without so much as a moan to the floor. They cured him of brain fever in the course of time all right, but they never cured him of coal. Up and down from one end of the division to the other, when he got around again, he talked coal harder than ever. It was his business. McQueen was doing the buying for the road. There ain't anything wrong with what I said about coal, he asserts with a smile when the boys put it up to him. Not for a minute. Good coal makes better steam, better everything, and pays the company. They saw that all right. That's why I'm buying it now, see? As for figuring it into the schedule, the sum was too hard and they couldn't do it. Me? Oh, I can't either. I lost the paper I did it for Noonan on. I ain't so good on figures as I was, huh? End of chapter 12、chapter 13 of On the Iron at Big Cloud by Frank L. Packard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 13. The Rebate. 
He was known as Dutchy, but his name was Damrosch. This is Dutchy's story when Dutchy and the Transcontinental were in the making, and before, as has been recorded elsewhere, he came to Big Cloud. He started railroading as cook's helper on a construction gang that was laying track across the prairie. As the mileage grew, so Dutchy grew. At first, blank and lean, he took on, little by little, the appearance of being comfortably nourished, until by the time they hit the Rockies, Dutchy's gait had become a waddle, and his innocent blue eyes were almost hidden by the great rolls of fat that puffed out of his face like a toy balloon. Then Dutchy, slow of body and likewise of brain, and yearning for a quiet and peaceful existence, secured the lunch counter rights for Dry Notch. Now, Dry Notch, halfway across the prairie, consisted of a water tank, a small roundhouse, a smaller station, and a diminutive general store. But because of its geographical position, it was headquarters for the Mid Plains Division. Here, T. V. Brett was superintendent. Thornley was his chief clerk, and MacDonald was dispatcher, and these, with the railroad hands and train crews, comprised the population of Dry Notch, unless there might be added a few ranchers somewhere in the neighborhood. The staff bunked in a room over the station, and the men had their quarters in the roundhouse, but one and all they ate at Dutchy's counter. Sinkers and coffee, apple pie and sandwiches, they stood as a steady diet for a month after he had appeared upon the scene and then a delegation waited upon him and demanded dishes more substantial. You can make meat pies and chicken stew and all that sort of thing, can't you? they demanded. Sure, said Dutchy, but that is expensive. Money was no object, they assured him, and thereupon proceeded to fix a schedule of prices. Fifteen cents for a meat pie, twenty cents for a chicken stew, with two slices of bread and butter thrown in for good measure. Well said Dutchy. So is it. And a few nights later, true to his promise, they got their chicken stew. Canned chicken stew. The huge pot full to the brim had been emptied, and Dutchy, his face beaming with smiles, had bustled into the back room for a further supply, when MacDonald's voice suddenly rose plaintively. It's, uh, it's chicken, in it? The crowd looked inquiringly at the dispatcher. Because, went on MacDonald softly, I never heard of any chicken in Dry Notch. And then, amid the laughter that ensued, Thornley rose dramatically from his seat, and, picking up a bone from his plate, waved it aloft. Gentlemen, this is no time for mirth, he cried. We are victims of a swindle. We are in the clutch of an octopus, that is to say, a food trust composed of Dutchy and the dining car conductors of number one and two. It is my painful duty to assert that I recognize this bone as the identical bone on which I fed two nights ago coming up the line on number one. Dutchy entered, staggering under the load of the replenished pot, when Thornley solemnly demanded a rebate on the spot. "'Thus is it,' said Dutchy, halting and peering passionately into the pot, then evidently reassured that no essential ingredient had been forgotten, he looked up at the ring of faces that were regarding him with grave inquiry. "'Thus is repate,' he demanded. "'It's something you smit the bread and butter for twenty cents to go, yes?' The crowd roared, and up and down the division train crews, engine crews, and section gangs got the joke, and passed it on until the lunch counter became known to every man on the system as the rebate. They did not explain the joke to Dutchy, and for days he endured the chaff stolidly, though with much bewilderment, until one afternoon MacDonald patiently and ploddingly acquainted him with the unhallowed baseness of one Thornley, helping himself by way of compensation to the heap of doughnuts under the glass cover. Dutchy listened, his cheeks getting redder and redder as MacDonald, exaggerating some hundredfold, suavely rubbed it in. "'That Thornley is, is a pig!' shouted Dutchy suddenly as the light burst in upon him. MacDonald nodded assent, his mouth too full of doughnut to speak. "'Aunt I a fool is, yes?' continued the proprietor, pounding a fat fist on the counter. Again MacDonald nodded, smiling sweetly, and reached for another doughnut but this time Dutchy's fingers were firmly clasped around the cover, and he peered suspiciously through the glass at the number of doughnuts remaining, then glared at the dispatcher. "'You—you you get out from here!' 
he said slowly, but with rising emphasis, and MacDonald, chuckling, went. It was not until after supper that same evening when Number One pulled in that Dutchy made any move toward retribution. Then Dutchy cut loose. It was Taggart who got it, little shorty Taggart, the driver of Number One, who was red-haired and an inveterate joker, and likewise a great crony of Thornley's. The first intimation MacDonald had that anything was up was an enraged howl that, rising from the tumult of the station, reached him where he sat in the dispatcher's office. There was no mistaking the voice. It was Dutchy's. MacDonald stuck his head hastily out of the window, while Thornley, who was in the room, leaned over his shoulder. Dutchy was bellowing like a mad bull. "'Say it! Just say it! Oh, pike collie!' Here followed a volcanic eruption of guttural German with one or two words common to all languages intermingled. Then, flying through the doorway of the lunchroom, dashing down the platform, scattering loungers, passengers, and car tinks in all directions, in a mad rush for the engine end of the train, tore a short figure in tight-fitting bandy-legged overalls, whose flaming red hair presented a shining mark for the plate that whizzed past his ear and smashed into a hundred pieces against a baggage truck and Dutchy, blowing hard, his sleeves rolled up over the fat of his arms, waddled to the center of the platform and shook a frantic fist after the retreating engineer. "'I, a fool, is no longer yet, don't it?' he screamed, and puffing his cheeks in and out like a wheezy injector, he turned, re-entered the restaurant, and the door closed behind him with a resounding bang. MacDonald drew in his head, and the tears were running down his cheeks as he held his sides. Thornley groped for a chair. "'Guess Taggart was asking for a rebate,' he gasped. "'It was worth pay to see him run.' "'You bet,' said MacDonald eloquently when he could get his breath. The door opened and Brett, the super, came in. "'You see Taggart and Dutchy, Brett?' cried Thornley. "'Yes,' said Brett, laughing. Then more seriously. "'Look here, you'd better patch it up with Dutchy. There's no use rubbing it in too hard.' "'McDonald, tell Blaney to put my car on number two when she comes in. I'm going east tonight.' The patching, however, was quite a different matter than talking about it. The next morning the lunchroom door was ominously closed, and the staff went breakfastless. By listening at the keyhole and from an occasional glimpse of the window, they knew that Dutchy was inside. But to pleadings, threats, and door kickings, the occupant was to all intents and purposes oblivious. Things began to look serious for the staff and station hands who were wont to depend on Dutchy for their grubstakes. Thornley whistled softly and pulled at his pipe, his feet on the dispatcher's desk. "'We'll have to open up when number 97 pulls in,' Thornley was saying, more by way of reassuring himself than of presenting any new view of the case to MacDonald. "'The company won't stand for any inconvenience to the passengers, that is,' he hastened to amend, "'not of that kind.' What? Uh, they've got a sort of lean on that joint, and if he waits for them to get after him, they'll get into trouble. I wish Brett were back. He'd make him open up quick, I guess. What's the matter with number 97, anyhow? Thought you said she was on time. So she is, said MacDonald, grinning. Hear her? From the eastward came the hoarse shriek from the whistle of a 500 class. Guess I'll go down, said Thornley. Coming? MacDonald nodded and got up from his chair. The two men reached the platform in time to acknowledge a flirt of the hand from Sanders in the cab as the big machine, wheel tires sparking from the tight-set brakes, rolled slowly past them, coming to a halt further on. Simultaneously, the door of the lunchroom swung wide open, and on the threshold, completely filling the opening with his bulk, stood Dutchy. In his left hand he held his bell, which he began to ring clamorously, in his right hand, almost but not quite concealed behind his apron, was no less a weapon than a substantial-looking rolling pin. A crowd of passengers began to surge toward the restaurant, and among them mingled the hungry railroad men of Dry Notch. "'Go on!' shouted Thornley, exultantly. "'I knew he'd have to open up. Here's where we feed, huh?' "'Wait!' cried Dutchy imperiously, as the head of the column reached him. "'You? Yes. You? No.' What is it? He was sorting the sheep from the goats, allowing the passengers to enter, pushing the railroaders ruthlessly to one side. You, yes. You, no. You, yes. You, oh, pay Cully. He had caught sight of Thornley, and swinging suddenly, struck out viciously in that direction with the rolling pin. 
being obliged, however, to maintain his position in the doorway, the strategic key to the situation, the jab fell short by two or three inches, barely missing Thornley's nose. Thornley fell back instinctively. But look here, you old ass, he yelled angrily. We've had about enough of this. It's just a joke. The company's got a lean on that joint of yours, and we'll close it up till tight will never open it again, you hear? Dutchy stopped short in the monotonous, you, yes, you, no, on which he had recommenced, and his paunch began to shake. Yeah, he cried, that is a choke. Oh, by golly, lean. That is when you get starving yet, yeah? Ah. <laughs> in Dutch's burst of merriment, first one and then another joined until even Thornley, his good nature getting the better of him, roared with the rest at his own expense. But if this apparent return to good humor on Dutchy's part inspired any hope in the minds of the railroad men that he had relented and that the former friendly relations were to be resumed, they were doomed to disappointment. For Dutchy stolidly continued to allow the passengers to go in and as stolidly barred the entrance of the others. Then they gave it up and bought out the slender stock of canned goods and biscuits from the shelves of the general store. They messed in the baggage room, and they swallowed their scanty portions to the tune of Die Wacht am Rhein, bellowed out by a strong and sonorous voice through the partition on the other side of which, laid out in tempting confusion, as they were painfully aware, was plenty. What they had, however, did little more than whet their appetites, and by three o'clock some of the men were talking of carrying the position by storm, helping themselves and doing a few fancy stunts with Dutchy. But we can't have any row, said Thornley, pulling at his mustache and staring at MacDonald. What had we better do? The boys will be pulling the old shaft down around his ears. He'll fight like blazes and someone will get hurt. And then the company will want to know what's what. Say, the old geezer has got us where he wants us, sure. Huh? What? MacDonald nodded. I'll tell you what it is, Thornley went on impressively. There's someone besides Dutchy in this. Eh, uh, they've been giving him a steer, and I'd give a few to know who it is. It's mighty queer Dutchy would wake up so suddenly to the fact that he was a joke. Uh, then there isn't anything to that rebate, Josh, to make him so sore. Someone's been stringing him good and plenty. What had we better do? I don't know, MacDonald answered. Let's go and see if we can't talk him over. At the sight of Thornley and the dispatcher heading for the lunchroom, the trainmen and station hands fell in behind them. MacDonald halted a few paces from the door. "'You boys stay here,' he directed. "'Let me see what I can do.' Thornley and the men halted obediently while MacDonald went on and knocked at the door. There was no response. "'The... Mr. Damrosh,' he called, "'is MacDonald. I want to talk to you.' This time his knock was answered, and so suddenly as to cause him to jump back in surprise. "'Well, what is it?' demanded Dutchy, scowling belligerently. "'Where—where?' Uh, where? stammered MacDonald, his confidence a little shaken at the proprietor's attitude. Then, desperately, "'Oh, I say, confound it all, Dutchy, we're hungry!' So Dutchy's exclamation was a world of innocent astonishment and kindly interest. Yes, went on MacDonald diplomatically. You bet we are. It's been a good joke, but you've had the best end of it. Let's call it quits. That's a good fella, and, and give us all a hand out. Dutchy listened attentively to the appeal. Aye, a fool is no longer yet, don't it? He queried softly. You most decidedly are not, MacDonald assured him. You will for repates no longer ask yet, persisted Mr. Damrosh. Not on your life replied the dispatcher earnestly, beginning to see daylight. That's all off. We'll apologize, too, if you like. I promise you, we are quite willing to apologize. Well, then, announced Mr. Damrosh, we will aggravate. And he slammed the door in MacDonald's face. Oh, hold on, Dutchy, cried MacDonald piteously, for he was very hungry. What did you say? What I said is that we will aggravate shouted Dutchy from the other side of the door. That is English, don't it? Aggravate? He means arbitrate, prompted Thornley from the platform. Oh, all right, said MacDonald. We'll agree to that, Dutchy. Come on, open up. I will not let you aggra uh, uh, do it, 
Hand that word, Dutchy asserted decisively, but again opening the door. But mit Mr. Brett, I will do it. But Mr. Brett isn't here, you know that retorted MacDonald, beginning to get exasperated. And what's more, he won't be back until the day after tomorrow. I guess you know that, too, don't you? Dutchy smiled a patient, chiding smile. That is too bad, he remarked regretfully. But that thornly a pig is. And you, oh, by golly, you, I could not, you belief. We will wait for Mr. Brett. He was closing the door again when MacDonald put his foot against the jam and, leaning toward Dutchy, said quickly, in an undertone, "'Look here, Dutchy, you're going too far. If I couldn't see any further than you, I'd wear glasses. Now's the time to make your deal. I'll help you, see? You can get anything out of the boys now, and, and you push them too far, and they'll pull the whole outfit down over your ears. You say what you want, and I'll get it for you.' Dutchy looked uh, meditatively into MacDonald's face, and shook his head with a sad smile of wisdom. "'I could not, you believe,' he repeated. Uh, yeah, "'You don't have to. You don't have to believe anybody. Whatever you want us to do, we'll do before you let us in to eat. You can't lose. What do you say?' Mr. Damrosch scratched his head pensively without taking his eyes off the dispatcher. After a minute he tapped MacDonald on the shoulder. "'Well,' he announced, I will tell you. Listen. MacDonald listened incredulously. Then he whistled a low, long-drawn-out note of consternation. Well, you got a nerve, he gasped. What do you think, huh? The boys will never— He stopped suddenly. A smile came over his face, and he chuckled softly to himself. Dutchy, you're great. It'll be meat for the boys to make Thornley stand for it. That's what you want to do. Make Thornley stand for it. Will the boys make him? Oh, will they? Give them a chance. That's the way to handle it. I told you I'd help you. Now, make your spiel. MacDonald turned to the group on the platform. Dutch, you'll arbitrate, he cried. At this the men began to push forward, but Dutchy stopped them. Wait as you is. Then der, der, hang that word. Is, then is it. Wait. They waited, and Dutchy began to count on his fingers. There is uh, sixteen that breakfasted, uh, didn't he began. That is, is, uh, average em up at a quarter apiece, prompted MacDonald in a whisper. That makes four dollars. Is four dollars, yes, went on Dutchy. Well, I want that. There is the cruise that in came and out went and didn't eat when the door was closed. That is uh, two dollars, yes. Well, I want that. The men came too, and a roar of derision rent the air, in the face of which even Dutchy was a little shaken. Stand pat, encouraged MacDonald. You got them coming and going. Dutchy held up his hand for silence. There is the sixteen over again yet, dot dinner didn't. Dot is four dollars, yes. Well, I want that. Dot is four and two and four. Dot is ten dollars, don't it? Well, I want that, and then you come in. Yes, one by one, for a quarter by each. Then, amid the storm of abuse and jeers that greeted Dutchy's ultimatum, MacDonald, with a final injunction to the proprietor to stand by his guns, turned and joined Thornley and the men. Fail, Pikali! screamed Dutchy above the din. What is it? Who was the commencer of that joke that is ten dollars to pay? It is that Thornley! Boy, you wretched old thief! he yelled Thornley. Do you think we're going to pay you for grub we didn't get because you wouldn't let us in to have it and then pay you for it again when you do dole it out? We'll see you further first. It was agreed in front of the... Hang that word. By the... Agreed nothing, snorted Thornley. That you will for rebates no longer ask yet, don't it? Well, the price ten dollars is. There is no rebate. Oh, by golly, Mr. Thornley, that was an expensive joke, yes? That was your joke, and I should sure thought me that I hope you will pay that yourself. Thornley paid, with no good grace, but because, as MacDonald had said they would, the men made him. Disgruntled and angry, he led the file into the restaurant, placing ten dollars and twenty-five cents in Dutchy's hand before he crossed the threshold. Behind him followed MacDonald and the grinning line of men, each contributing their quarters in advance 
for the first square meal they had had that day. "'Eat what you like,' said Dutchy magnanimously. Thornley glared. "'Eat what you like. Eat what you like.' He mimicked savagely. "'I like your colossal generosity at my expense.' For a long time there was no other noise save the rattle of dishes and the busy clatter of knives, forks, and spoons. Then Thornley beckoned to Dutchy. "'Well, what is it?' inquired the proprietor from behind the counter. "'Who put you on to this?' demanded Thornley. "'I've had to stand for it, and I'd like to know. I would that.' MacDonald, sitting beside Thornley, noticed with some misgivings a peculiar expression sweep over Dutchy's face. But to his relief the proprietor's only reply was a grunt, as he answered a call for more coffee. "'By the hokey, I'll bet it was that red-haired Taggart!" exclaimed Thornley suddenly, turning to the dispatcher. MacDonald buried his face in his cup, ostensibly to drain the last drop. Then he set it down quickly and jerked his watch from his pocket. "'Holy Moses!' he ejaculated and fled from the room. An hour later, as Thornley was again sitting with his feet on MacDonald's desk, Dutchy stuck his head into the room and beckoned to the dispatcher. MacDonald walked across the room and joined him. Dutchy pulled him out of the room and closed the door. "'There is one thing that I forgot it did,' announced Mr. Damrosch. "'What's that?' inquired MacDonald. "'There is five doughnuts that is paid for not.' "'Oh,' said MacDonald. "'That was the time you told that it was Thornley, yes? "'That was one dollar per each. "'Well, I want that, yes?' <laughs> "'Really?' laughed MacDonald. "'Well, I guess not.' "'That was the time?' Dutchy was raising his voice, each word growing louder and more distinct than the preceding one. Thornley's chair inside creaked ominously. MacDonald glanced furtively toward the door, and his face grew red. "'You told that?' With a hasty movement, MacDonald clapped one hand over Dutchy's mouth and with the other thrust a five-dollar bill into his fingers. "'Get out!' he choked and shoved Dutchy violently toward the stairs. At the bottom, Dutchy halted, turned, and looked up with a grin. "'Pi Kali,' said he. "'I sure thought me that I like chokes pretty good, and I hope that—' "'Oh, shut up!' said MacDonald. End of Chapter 13 Chapter 14 of On the Iron at Big Cloud by Frank L. Packard this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 14. Speckles This happened at a period in the history of the Hill Division when trade was very bad, and the directors, scowling over the company's annual report, threw up their hands in holy horror, while from the sacred precincts of the boardroom there emanated the agonized cry, Economy! The general manager took up the slogan and dinned it into the ears of the division superintendents. Operating expenses are too high, he wrote. They must be cut down. And the superintendents of divisions, painfully alive to the fact that the GM was not dictating for the mere pleasure of it, intimated in unmistakable language to the heads of departments under them that the next quarterly reports were expected to show a marked improvement. John Healy had charge of the roundhouse at Big Cloud in those days, and the morning after the lightning struck the system, he came fuming back across the yards from his interview with the superintendent, stuttering angrily to himself. As he stamped into the running shed, his humor a shade worse than usual, the first object that caught his eye was Speckles, squatted on the lee side of 483, dangling his legs in the pit. That is, it would have been the lee side if Healy had come in the other door. Cut down operation expenses, is it? Healy muttered. Begor, I begin right now. And he fired Speckles on the spot. Now Speckles, whose name, by the way, was Dolliver Washington Babson, had been fired on several occasions before, and if he swallowed a little more tobacco juice than was good for his physical comfort, it was rather as a gulp of startled surprise at Healy's appearance than because of any poignant regret at the misfortune that had overtaken him. Nevertheless, he felt it incumbent on himself to expostulate. "'Get out and stay out,' said Healy, refusing to argue. And Speckles got out. For a day he kept away from the roundhouse, the length of time past experience had taught him was required to cool the turner's anger. 
Then he sauntered down again and came face to face with Healy on the turntable. I came down to ask you to put me on again, Mr. Healy, he began, broaching the subject timidly. What? demanded Healy. I came down to ask you to put me on again, Mr. Healy, Speckles repeated monotonously. Oh, I heard you. I heard you, said Healy a little inconsistently. On again, is it? Uh, it'll be a long time, me son. Mark that. This being quite different from Healy's accustomed, well, get back to your job. It began to filter vaguely through Speckles' brain that his name was no longer to adorn the company's pay sheets. Am I fired for good, Mr. Healy? He faltered. You are, said Healy, just that. Then, relenting a little as Speckles' face fell, if t'were not for the big bugs down yonder, he jerked his thumb in the general direction of the east, I might, mind I don't say I would, but I might put you on again. As it is, we've instructions to cut down the operating expenses, and that's an end of it. Spreckles stood for a moment in dismay as Healy went back into the roundhouse. Then he turned disconsolately away, crossed the tracks to the platform of the station, and, seeking out a secluded corner of the freight house, sat down upon a packing case to think it out. To Spreckles it was no mere matter of cutting down expenses. It was a blasted career. Whatever Speckles' faults, and he was only a lad, he had one redeeming quality, before which, in the eyes of the business he had elected to follow, his strayings from the straight and narrow path dwindled into insignificance. Railroading was born in him. At ten he had started in as caller for the night crews, and during the five years the company had had the benefit of his valuable services in that capacity, there was not a man on the division but sooner or later came to know long-armed, bony, freckle-faced, red-haired speckles, came to know the little rascal, and like him, too. Then Speckles had been promoted to the post of sweeper in the roundhouse, and occasionally, under Healy's critical inspection, to washing out boiler tubes. Fresh fuel thereby added to the fire of his ambition, he began to figure how long it would be before he got to wiping, then to firing, and after that, even Speckles' boundless optimism did not have the temerity to specify any particular date, the time when he would attain his goal and get his engine. Now, instead, at the age of sixteen, he found himself seated on a cracker box, his dreams for the future rudely shattered, thanks to Healy, old sour-face Healy. So Speckles sighed, and as he sighed, the shop whistle blew. It was noon, and the men began to pour out of the big gates. Then Speckles, remembering that the schools were also letting out, hurried down the platform and up the main street. He would confide in Madge. Madge would understand. Madge Bolton was the daughter of the ticket agent at the station, and between Mr. Bolton and Speckles there existed a standing feud, the causus belli being fifteen-year-old blue-eyed Madge. Speckles kicked his heels on the corner until she appeared, then he turned and fell into step beside her, reaching a little awkwardly for her strap of books. "'Hello, doll,' was Madge's greeting. She was the only person in Big Cloud who did not call him Speckles. Hello, Madge, he returned. Madge glanced at his face and hands. Haven't you been to work? she asked. No. Why, doll? Byron, said Speckles laconically. Oh, doll, again, she cried reproachfully. What for? Tain't only the third time, and, and wasn't for nothing, said Speckles a bit sullenly. I was only resting. Dolliver Babson, she accused. You were loafing. Oh, doll, you'll never get to firing, and... And she hesitated and stopped, her cheeks a little red with a hint of a boy and girl castle building that would have increased her father's ire against the luckless Speckles had he seen it. Speckles, somewhat shamefaced and having no excuse to offer, trudged on in silence. Did you ask Mr. Healy to take you back? she inquired after a moment. He won't, said Speckles. What are you going to do, doll? I, I don't know. Well, said Madge, hopefully. Perhaps you could get a job in one of the stores. I'll ask Mr. Timmons, the grocer, if you like. I know him pretty well. Speckles came to an abrupt and sudden halt, cast in Madge's face one look that carried with it a world of unutterable reproach, handed over her books in silence, and fled. He, a railroad man, go into a store. And this from Madge, 
Mad you of all others, it was ill, it was too much. Speckles ate his dinner, dispirited and crushed. Everything and everybody was against him. His mother's curt inquiry as to when he was going back to work did not in any way tend to mitigate his troubles, rather, on the contrary, to accentuate them. Old sour face won't put me back, he jerked out in response to his mother's repeated question. No wonder he won't, said his mother sharply. If you're so disrespectful as that, I'm ashamed of you and you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Speckles was too much depressed to offer any defense. He finished his meal in silence, gulped down his cup of tea in two swallows, took his hat, and started out. Unconsciously, he directed his steps toward the yards, and some five minutes later arrived at the station. Here, about halfway down the platform, he spotted Matt Bolton in the open doorway of the ticket office. As he approached, the nonchalant air with which the other leaned with folded arms against the jamb of the door aroused Speckles' suspicions. To reach the seat of his meditations, the cracker box in the freight shed, which had now become his objective point, he would be obliged to pass Mr. Bolton. He therefore began to incline his course toward the edge of the platform nearest the rails, so that when he came opposite the office door some fifteen feet were between him and his arch-enemy. Mr. Bolton awoke from his lethargy with surprising suddenness. "'You young rascal!' he shouted. "'What have you been doing to my girl? I'll teach you to make girls cry, you little speckle-faced runt, you!' He made a dash for Speckles, but by the time he had recovered his balance and saved himself from toppling over the edge of the platform to the tracks, Speckles had reached the safe retreat of the freight shed door. And as the irate parent, after shaking his fist impotently, walked back and disappeared within his domain, Speckles indulged in a series of pantomimes in which his fingers and his nose played an intimate and comprehensive part. Perched once more on the cracker box, Speckles again resolved himself into a committee on ways and means. His little skirmish with Madge's father had exhilarated him to such an extent that his heavy and oppressing sense of despondency had vanished, and in its place came a renewed determination to resume, somehow or other, the railroad career that Healy had so emphatically interrupted. He turned over in his mind the feasibility of applying to Regan, the master mechanic, for a job in the shops but dismissed the idea almost immediately on the ground that shopmen were not, strictly speaking, railroaders. He might start in switching and braking and work up to conductor. That, at least, was railroading, not to be compared with engine driving, not by long odds, but still it was railroading. His face brightened. He would interview Farley, the trainmaster. Farley was in his office. Speckles had not very far to go, only a few steps down the platform. All the offices, and Big Cloud was division headquarters, were under the same roof. At Speckles' request, Farley swung around in his swivel chair with a quizzical expression on his face. Then he grinned. Want to go on the train cruise, eh? Uh, what do you think, kid, that I'm running a kindergarten outfit? Even if some of them do act like it. How old are you? Sixteen, said Speckles with sinking heart. Sixteen, eh? You better come back in a couple of years and... But for the second time that day, Speckles fled. He was in no mood to stand more chaffing, and Farley, as he well knew, had a leaning that way. Speckles halted outside the door, undecided what move to make next, when the clicking of the instruments in the dispatcher's room overhead came to his ears like an inspiration. Why hadn't he thought of that before? Spence, who had been on the night trick most of the years that Speckles was caller, was now chief dispatcher. If he had any friend anywhere, it was Spence the man at whose elbow he had sat through those long dark hours of the night that begat confidences, and into whose ears he had so often poured the tales of his cherished aims and ambitions. Speckles covered the stairs three steps at a time in his new-found exuberance. Spence looked up from his key and listened as Speckles told his story. So you're Healy's contribution to economy, eh? Huh? he said when Speckles had finished, and he won't take you back. No, said Speckles. Well, that's pretty tough, but I don't see how I can help you any, Speckles. I haven't any rights over Healy, you know. Speckles hesitated a moment and fidgeted nervously from one foot to the other. Uh, I, I know you ain't, he began, but I thought maybe you'd put me on here. <laughs> what? ejaculated Spence. Then, smothering a laugh at the sight of Speckles' woe-begone countenance, he demanded gravely, You, uh, you mean dispatching? Speckles nodded. 
No, no, Speckles, that would never do. You go back and see Healy. I'll do what I can for you with him. It won't do no good, said Speckles hopelessly. I've asked him twice already. Well, ask him again. Look here, Speckles, it's up to you to square yourself with Healy somehow or other. If you want your job very badly, you ought to be sharp enough to find a way of getting it. Go on now. So Speckles descended the stairs to the platform and irresolutely began to cross the tracks in the direction of the running shed. He reached the roundhouse and skirmished cautiously along its front. No Healy was in sight, so he dived in between two engines and made his way to the rear of the shed. Here, by peering around the end of a tender, he could see Healy's cubbyhole. Healy called it an office. A bit of space about four by six partitioned off from the back wall in the corner, with a greasy book the engine crew signed, and two or three others, equally greasy, in which Healy kept tabs on things in general. In spite of his trepidation, Speckles grinned. Healy was there, bending over a very flimsy, spindle-legged table that he had wheedled out of the claim agent some months before. His brows were puckered into a ferocious scowl, and he growled and muttered to himself, now laboring furiously with a stubby pencil on the sheets of paper in front of him, now pausing to bite that unoffending article almost in two in his desperation. Healy was working on his invention. All the division knew about Healy's ideas on Westinghouse and Air, and that these ideas, when perfected, were to be patented. As to what the consensus of opinion of their value was is neither here nor there, except that in Healy's presence, when referred to at all, the subject was treated with dignity and respect. For Healy's physical powers were beyond the ordinary, and dearest to Healy's heart and most sacred in his eyes was this creation of his brain, or, to be more accurate, fancy. Speckle sided up to the cubby hole and, without any peroration, took the plunge. I came to ask you to put me on again, Mr. Healy. He spoke rapidly, as though he feared his courage might ooze out before he could finish. Healy wheeled around with a grunt. Oh, it's you, is it? he demanded grimly. Speckles, ready to run at the first sign of violence, acknowledged the impeachment by nodding his head affirmatively and smiled sheepishly while Healy scrutinized him with a long stare from head to foot. Well, said Healy, you wait a minute and I'll give you me answer. Speckles' heart bounded in joyous hope. Healy very deliberately gathered up his papers, folded them carefully, and opening the cupboard where his coat hung, it was a hot day and Healy was in his shirt sleeves, tucked them into the inside pocket. Then like a flash he turned and reached for the first thing in sight. It was a broom, but quick as he was, Speckles was quicker, and he led Healy by the length of the pit as he dodged around the tail end of a tender and darted out of the running shed across the tracks to the freight house. Healy followed no farther than the turntable. Then he halted, and Speckles, from his retreat, saw him shake his fist and listen to the threat that thundered across the yards. Show your face around here again, you young rascal, and I'll bait the life out of you, so I will. Speckles betook himself to the cracker box and from his lips there flowed a fluent and unrestrained expression of his opinion on things in general, but more particularly of Healy, and more particularly still of Healy's invention. Then, his indignation subsiding, it was followed by a fit of the blues, so that when at the expiration of half an hour Healy, still in his shirt sleeves, came out of the roundhouse and walked up the tracks in the direction of the shops, Speckles, through the freight house door, remarked the incident in complete apathy and as one in which he had no interest whatever. Ten minutes later, however, his apathy vanished and he sprang to his feet at the sound of the excited shouts of the men in the running shed. Some were hastily swinging the big engine doors wide open, others were setting the table in position, while one started on a run in the direction Healy had taken. Another minute and the shop whistle had boomed out its warning, and as Healy, with the man who had gone after him, came tearing down the track like mad, Speckles saw the smoke beginning to curl up over the roof at the back. The running shed was afire. With a whoop, Speckles traversed the platform, leaped to the rails, and was hard on Healy's heels by the time the turntable was crossed. Healy paused but an instant. The thing to do was to get the engines out, and Healy was the man to do it. Get tackle rigged on, uh, 463, he ordered. She's cold and uh, we'll have to haul her out. Set the table for 518. I'll take her. Then he started on the jump for the cubby hole and his precious papers. 
Now the tackle that Healy had referred to was stored in the rear of the roundhouse in the same general direction as the cubby hole, and as the order had been given to no one in particular, Speckles, shouting, I'll get it, started after Healy. Some grease and waste had caught and was rolling up a nasty smoke. Through it, even while he tugged manfully at the heavy tackle, Speckles saw Healy run into his office, snatch his coat, rush out again, and dash for the cab of 518, throwing the coat up on the tender. As he did so, something fell from the pocket. Speckles dropped the tackle and pounced upon it. It was the bundle of papers he had seen Healy put in his coat pocket a little while before. It was Healy's invention. Speckles' first impulse was to shout to Healy, but just then 518 glided out of the shed, and the men in front of 463 were yelling in chorus for the tackle, so Speckles put his tongue in his cheek and the papers in his pocket. It wasn't much of a blaze, but it looked bad while it lasted. Even after the shop hands had got their hose lengths connected and a stream playing on the fire, and the engines were all in safety in the yard, the smoke continued to roll out in clouds, with here and there a vicious tongue of flame. Then Healy, his duty done, bethought him of his coat on the tender of 518. And Speckles, as he heard Healy's gasp of dismay on discovering that his papers were gone, had an inspiration. "'Me papers! Me papers!' wailed Healy. "'For the love of Mike, I must have dropped them on the floor!' "'I'll get them for you, Mr. Healy,' said Speckles, quick as a shot. "'You're not,' said Healy. "'I'll have no one risk his life for them, bad as I want them. "'Hey, come back, you runt!' But Speckles was gone. Headed straight for the big, yawning doors that vomited their smoke and flames? Oh, no, not Speckles. Hardly. Speckles would make his attempt from the rear, and around the end of the shed and in behind he raced. Some of the men were fighting the fire from that side, but they were too busy to pay any attention to Speckles. A dab of soot and dirt on his face, which he obtained by rubbing his fingers along the blackened wall, an artistic smudge of generous proportions on the outside of the papers, which he took from his pocket, and Speckles' make-up was complete and convincing. Now, Speckles had an eye for the dramatic and an appreciation of its value. He peered in through one of the windows. It was not nearly as bad inside as it had been, and he decided there would be no risk and very little discomfort in carrying out the plan that had popped into his head. So he climbed in through a window, and he dropped down on the floor on the other side. The next minute he had dashed through the running shed and emerging from a whirl of black smoke into the open in front of the turntable, the papers waved aloft in his fist. It was effective, decidedly effective. A cheer went up and the men crowded around while Healy rushed forward and began to pump Speckles' arm up and down like an engine piston. "'That's a hero you are, me bright jewel of a lad,' he cried in his delight. "'Tis meself, John Healy, as says it, and as the boys are me witness. Come back to your job in the morning, and by my soul, Speckles, I'll never fire you again, never. Uh, and it's more I'll do. I'll promote you. That's a wiper you are from now on, me son, and to blazes with cutting down operating expenses. Where did you find the papers?' "'On the floor,' said Speckles. And he told the truth. End of chapter 14